praise God. Hallelujah. So I'm just going to go ahead and, and draw this little illustration, and then I will uh, I will try to, to we'll, we'll explain it before the message is over. Some of the things actually have been probably we talked a little bit about some of these things, but uh, so this is supposed to be the sun right here, and this right here is sunlight. Okay. And then this is this is the moon right here, okay? And then we're going to say that this is a, I guess you'd say the dark side of the moon. There's no significance to that. We just know that the moon does go through different phases. And then we're going to say that this right here is the Earth. I know the Earth's probably much bigger, but just bear with me, okay? And so anyway, so we know that we know that the sun. Uh, shines its light upon the earth, right? And that it illuminates the earth. And so the idea would be that the uh, sun is shining here and that this part of the earth is illuminated with its uh, brightness, right? And, and that, but also, so, so let me ask you this. So whenever we see the light of the moon, I mean, this is not really that part of the question, but when we see the light of the moon, so does the moon have its own light? No. No, the moon doesn't have its own light. The moon, where does the moon get its light from? The sun. From the sun. So the moon is a reflection of the light of the sun, right? And so um, anyway, with that said, I wanted to talk to you a little bit tonight about the image of God. And I know that we've talked about that uh, already to some extent, but there's a couple of little things that were a little bit different. So in Genesis chapter one, verse 26, the word of God says, and God said, let us make man in our image. So this is Genesis. And, and I don't know, and we may not have anybody working. Um, yeah. Okay. That, you, you could do that. I don't think Rich, I mean, Rich could figure it out. That's not his forte. Praise God. So in Genesis 126, if you have your Bible, you can just turn there. If not, they'll get it up there sooner or later. It says, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, right? Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. Now, I don't mean to be overly redundant because I know that I've been talking to so many people about these concepts. I feel certain that I've already spoken to y'all about it to some extent. So just bear with me as we, it, it, some of this may be a little bit of a review, but one of the things that I've learned is, is that repetition is a great key and tool yeah. to learning and to really get it solidified in your spirit. And so we know that when God created the heaven and the earth and all that in them is that when he created the earth, this physical realm, that he created it for for Adam to have dominion and authority. That's what it said right there. It says, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created the earth for Adam to be, I guess we could use the terminology a co-regent, uh, meaning a, a, a co-ruler with him to have authority on the earth. And, and we know that, that from Luke chapter four, that Satan said to Jesus, he said, if you bow before me, I will give you all these kingdoms and all the power thereof for they have been delivered to me. And we've talked about that verse of scripture also because in Adam and Eve's deception, if you will, I'm not trying to get technical on that, but in, in, in Eve's deception and Adam's willingness to fall the way of the serpent, that the power that and dominion and the authority that was given to Adam was usurped or taken from who it was originally intended for, was for Adam uh, to, to have dominion on the earth. And, and then the enemy gained access or gained power. Jesus said this about Satan. This is Jesus' words. He said it three times in the Gospel of John that he called him the prince of this world, right? And, he, and, he, and so he's talking about the fact that he does have power in this world. But the good news is, and we know this, is that what Jesus did, not only does it save us, but it also gives us power and the, the, the dominion and the authority back 
that was lost in Adam. And it's important that we understand that. And when Jesus said that about that we have power to tread on serpents and scorpions, that's not just so that we can see deliverances, although I do believe that God does deliver people from demonic power. Amen. But one of the things that I've noticed is this, is that if we're walking in the power and the authority of God, if we understand who we are in Christ and we see the power of God operating in our lives, it doesn't matter where we go. The works of darkness do not prevail over us. Amen. Instead, we have power and dominion to, to accomplish, amen, what God has called us to do. So, but really right now, I want to talk to you a little bit about the word image and likeness, the two words image and likeness that are in that first passage we read. So this is kind of like just to get you to thinking a little bit. I'm not telling you that I'm completely right. Okay, this is not, this is not right or wrong. This is just to kind of stimulate your thinking, all right? So when God says that he made man in his image and after his likeness, what do you imagine that means? Have you ever really thought about it much? Have you put much thought into that? I think a lot. I mean, maybe too much. But I think a lot about various things having to do with, with the scripture. And that's something that I've definitely thought about before. You know, some of the, some, so, you know, if you don't want to shout it out, uh, that's cool. But so some things like, do you imagine it's because God looks like a man? That, and so, therefore, he created man in his image and likeness. Now, I do know that God sits on the throne, amen, and that Jesus is seated at his right hand. But do you, do you feel like that means that, that God in his image and likeness looks like the way that he created man? And maybe, and maybe there's some truth to that, but we, we really just... We don't know. We know that we know that Jesus was the express image of God. That's what the Word of God says in the New Testament. So there could be some level of truth to that, right? Uh, what about what about? Um, do you think that it's because God is a triunity and man is tripartite? Now look, I'm just that fancy word tripartite. Let me just tell you what it means. Divided into or composed of three parts. Okay. So you, as a human being are composed of three parts, right? We've talked about that recently. You, you have a body, you have a soul, which is your mind, your will, and your emotions, and you are a spirit. The spiritual part of you is the part, we've talked about this, that will never die, okay? And so you will exist for eternity. Spirit beings don't die. Now, it does talk about the great white throne judgment, and it does talk about the second death, but that's not talking about that you just implode or explode when you die or you go to soul sleep and never wake up. When it's talking about the second death, it's talking about eternal torment and separation from God. All right. And so. So my question is, so so you're a spirit being and you're going to live forever and your soul is who you are. It's what makes Elena Elena, what makes Galdenzio Munez, Galdenzio Munez, what makes Matt Abair Matt Abair. You have a distinct personality, right? You, you were born in a certain home at a certain place at a certain time. You grew up and all of these things affected the person that you are and who you have become. But you are a distinct personality and you, and you, and you understand that. You're, you're an individual and you're, and you're different than the person that you sit on the side of. Okay, so, so do you think that that's what it is? That because we are made up of three persons... And that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That that's what God was talking about. Maybe there's some level of that. I mean, I don't know. Does anybody, is everybody okay so far? Y'all just thinking, right? I can see. Y'all thinking pretty hard. Okay. Or is it possible that what, what in some way before the fall, man was a reflection of God's glory. Man's sinlessness, when he was created in Adam, his the splendor. And the brightness of God, amen, was, was, was part of who Adam was, was part of who Eve was when God pulled Eve out of it. You see, that's, that's where the Lord has been having me focused on thinking about the image and likeness of God and how mankind was born in the image and likeness of God. And then the idea, let, let, me, let me just tell you this. I didn't look it up in the Hebrew, but in the Greek. The word image that's used mostly is this word here. This is kind of interesting. I feel like 
This in the Greek, if you were going to spell it in English, it would be spelled like this, icon. So, you know, we've, we have this English word, icon, and it's kind of like a physical representation of another concept, right? But the word for, for in the Greek for icon is used of the moral likeness of renewed men to God. That's the Strong's Greek Dictionary. Let me, let me just say this too. Does everybody have a Strong's Greek Dictionary or a Strong's Dictionary? So the Strong's Dictionary, just to let you know, because you hear me talk about it sometimes, it's a dictionary. It's a thick book. You can buy it online. You know, you can get it in your computer now. Uh, but it's, it's got the Hebrew and the Greek. So the Old Testament's written in Hebrew. The New Testament's written in Greek. And it's got all the Hebrew words uh, that, it, that it chronicles and it gives you the definition. And it's got all the Greek words and it gives you the definition. Now, one of the things that I want to tell you, I don't know that I really thought about this a whole lot till a few months ago. The Strong's Dictionary is a dictionary that obviously was compiled by a man named Strong. Okay. <laughs> and what that means is, is that Strong obviously had helped probably helped to compile this work, but that him and his helpers were Hebrew and Greek scholars, okay? But they were men. And so what we're learning from that is this, is that these are the definitions of Hebrew and Greek words that Hebrew and Greek scholars are giving us the definition to, okay? So what does that mean? That they're men, just like translators are men, they're men too. So we can utilize the tool, but still, they are men. Amen? Does that make sense? In other words, the Strong's definitions are not inspired by the Holy Spirit. Amen? But it's some really, really smart people that are a lot smarter than you or I that are giving us these definitions yeah. is all I'm trying to say. All right? And so what the, now let's just slow it down a little bit and say this. The, in the Greek language, the word image that's translated to image in the New Testament, it means this. This is the definition they gave it. It's used to describe the moral likeness of renewed men to God. Now, the guys in the jail, because because I know I was preaching this to y'all tonight, and I said, I'm not going to read and refurbish it. I'm just going to go ahead and give it to them, too. And they were pretty fired up about it. But I asked this one old boy, I'm like, what do you think he's talking about when he says the likeness, the moral likeness of renewed men? And one guy over there to, the, to my right said, born again. And I'm like, amen, brother. That's exactly right. Born again. Hallelujah. And so that's in order for a person to be renewed, right? They have to be born again. They have to have truly been converted from their former way of life, right? And, and how are they born again? How are they converted from their former way of life? Because, see, the first time we were born, we were born how? In, in Adam. We were born in Adam, right? So we got some guests tonight, you know, people that don't come all the time. That's what this is all about. If anybody was ever wondering what this is about, this is telling us that the old man that was born in Adam, that's your first natural birth, right, died when you put faith in Christ. When you put faith in Jesus, the old man that was born of Adam, in the mind of God, he died. Okay, and he was buried with Jesus in the tomb. And just as Jesus was raised from the dead, the Bible says that we also should walk in newness of life. Because the Bible teaches that the old man has passed away and that a new man has come. The Bible teaches that the old life has passed away and that we've become new creations in Christ Jesus. No, really, you are a new creation if you are born again. And part of the song that when we were singing had to do with, you know, the chains being broken, right? And the lies yes. being broken because, and, and I really felt that she was definitely, I believe, obviously led by the Holy Spirit when she started saying that about the lies being broken because the lies are the chains. Because if the enemy can prevent you and I from believing the truth and instead stay focused on the lies that he tries to tell us, what does he try to tell us? When we fall short of God's glory, he tries to heap condemnation upon our backs. He tries to heap condemnation upon our minds. He tries to make us feel guilty. But the word of the Lord says that if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. The word of God says you are justified by faith. Amen. That means that you have been declared righteous by God based upon your faith. And you and I need to start to learn how to see ourselves the way God sees us. Look, it says it in Romans chapter 6, 
verse 11, it says, um, Therefore, reckon yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin and alive unto God. So he, the word reckon means that you're supposed to believe this to be true. The word, the idea is, and if you read the whole book of Romans, what you would learn is this, is that God says this about you. God says that you're innocent based upon what Jesus did, and you're free based upon what Jesus did when you put faith in that. Amen. And now he's telling us to reckon it to be true, yes. to believe Amen. that we Amen. truly are dead to sin and alive to God. So what that means is, is that sin is not your master. So if you think tonight that sin has control over you, you're wrong. You're wrong and you're believing in a language, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're believing the whispers of the enemy. That's right. Now, listen, this process doesn't happen overnight. This is a process that does take place and it takes time for us to have to allow our mind to be renewed according to the word of God. But I want to encourage you to, that, that what we're the fight is the fight of faith. Amen. To fight the good fight of faith. And to believe that the, that his sacrifice was what? How did the song say it? All sufficient. All sufficient, All sufficient sacrifice. Amen? <laughs> All right. And so I kind of went off on a little bit of a rabbit trail. But I, I felt like the Lord wanted you to know that. Amen? That you are a new creation of Christ. So before the fall of man, Adam was created in the image and likeness of God. And we can at least agree that there's a connection to the glory, the splendor, the sinlessness that Adam was originally created in, right? And I feel very confident that, that we're on the right trail whenever we start to speak that because the scripture teaches in Genesis 5, 3, and I know y'all heard me say this one quite a bit, but let's look at Genesis 5, 3, if we can put it up there. G Genesis 5, 3 says, and Adam lived 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness after his image and called his name Seth. Now, I want to be honest with you. The first time the Holy Spirit showed me this passage of scripture, I kind of was like, wait, what? Like, dude, I ran with this scripture. I'm telling you right now. And I, I think I offended somebody at one of my workplaces the other day, a guy that hadn't really been serving the Lord in a long time. And I was trying to explain this to him. He didn't seem to really like what I was trying to say. But what the Holy Spirit showed me so many, many years ago is that you, mankind in Adam was created in the image and likeness of God. But man born of Adam is not born in the image and likeness of God. Man born of Adam is born in the image and likeness of his father, Adam. Yes. And what does that mean? Adam, when he gave, when he sired these sons, was fallen. You know, I've never even thought this deeply about this before, but while we're having fun and we're thinking, let's think about this. I thought about this. I said, you know what? What if somebody, because I've had people challenge me before. Well, you don't know that that one of them boys couldn't have been born before the fall. You know what? I, I just, I, I used other terminology to try to describe it, but last night or this morning, whatever time it was, when I was having a hard time sleeping, I started thinking about this. I said, but you know what? Let's just pretend for a second that we're pretending, we're thinking, okay? Let's pretend for a second that one of the first boys was born with, before the fall. Which one would you propose that it was? Abel. Abel. It'd have to have been Abel, right? Why? Because when it came, well, who was Cain? What does the Bible list him as? The first murderer. God has no sin in him. How in the world did Cain turn into a murderer? Because he was born into sin. Okay, but Abel, but, but this is the thing. If Abel happened to be born before the fall, which that's not really what happened, then guess what? He wasn't alive anymore because his brother killed him. And now we're hearing the third child, Seth, was born in the image and likeness of his father Adam. That was just like a little thinking about the scriptures is all that was. 
But so the point being is this, is that we're born in the image and likeness of our father, Adam. And so we're talking about we're talking about image and likeness and we're talking about the glory of God. And we're talking about uh, God's image. Right. And the importance of that upon the earth. Now, one of the things I did do is I kind of looked 59 times the word image is used in the Old Testament. Approximately five times the word is connected to God in some way. I created Adam in my image and likeness. And the, in some way, five times the word image is used to describe the work of God. Every other time is talking about graven images. You shall not make graven or molten images to other gods. You shall not worship these false gods. And repeatedly, this terminology is, uh, is being used. There's other scriptures that talk about that even in the New Testament. In Romans chapter 1, verse 23, it says, And that they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. And so they started to make the New Testament talks about the old days and says that what man started to do is they refused to recognize God as creator. And so they started making their own gods and, and putting them to as graven images so that they could worship them. I was thinking about this concept here because I used to talk about this, but I never really had an illustration. And I don't know how well this will work. But if you if you could imagine that the pulpit is the Lord, I'm just trying to use this as an example. And because because reality is, is that we're supposed to keep our eyes squarely focused on Jesus. That's why I love that song. Turn your eyes on Jesus. Amen. And look full into his wonderful face. And so if, the, if this pulpit represents Jesus and I represent a graven image, I represent an idol. See, what ends up happening is, is that I am obscuring the focus on Jesus. So something is standing in between me and Jesus, right? And so if people are looking at statues and they're, or they're, look, I'm just going to be real. I didn't plan on going, going here, but I'm going to say it. If people are worshiping Mary and praying to Mary, then Mary now is standing in the way of Jesus. What else can we say can stand in the way of Jesus? Things that the world has to offer. Because see, what we're supposed to be doing is we're supposed to be keeping our eyes on the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords because he is the answer to our problems. Right. The majority of us in this place believe that in our heart. There's not really going to be an argument from most of you that are going to say, you know, no, I don't really believe that preacher. No, most of you believe that Jesus is the answer to our problems. Yet at the same time, we keep seeking after other things to try to fill the emptiness or the void that we feel is on the inside of our heart. And the world has a plethora of things to offer. And so what I'm trying to get to you is this, is that these things that the world offers in a sense are like graven images and idols. And they stand in the way in front of God and they obscure the view for us to be able to see God. So we're not really looking whenever we're going through painful times and we're going through situations. And listen, you could plug in a whole lot of stuff right here and I don't even know that I'm going to plug in one. Okay? Even though I'm, I, I, it's hard for me to fight it back. <laughs> the Holy Spirit surely can reveal to you all of the various things that human beings can put in front of God. And, and, and a lot of times, you know, and these guys were agreeing with me. A lot of times it's because we've been in so much pain, right? I, I mean, yeah. many of us have experienced pain when we were young. I know, I know for a fact that, that they're in a crowd. I mean, even that's not a huge crowd. There's, there's multiple people in this crowd that have been molested. I know that that's a weird thing for us to talk about. But there's multiple people in this. I know for a fact that there's more than one person in this crowd that's doing this. Because they told me. Uh, you know, and, and, and it probably would be people that you would be surprised by. All right. But nevertheless, these kinds of things happen. And not just, and even, even though like that didn't happen to me, thank God, bad things happen to me. Painful things happen to me. Right. Hurtful things happen to human beings because the world has fallen. And people, and because of the world, and, and people hurt other people. And the enemy hates us, and he wants to destroy us. 
And so most of the time what we're trying to do, because we've been filled with so much pain and hurt, we're trying to really kind of like escape a little bit. Right. And these are the, the, the things that we run after to try to grab a hold of are partly escapism. And you can look, I'm just going to I'm going to use one that 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 has happened to me in the past. Once you start able to stream, I was going through some stuff. I'm just going to be real with you. I mean, this is after I was a pastor. And, and and I ain't going back to alcohol, hallelujah. But guess what? I just sent me back to alcohol because I end up start streaming these Netflix series. I'm wasting God's time. I'm just trying to tell you how the Lord convicted me. I'm not, you watch whatever you want to watch. That's between you and the Holy Ghost. I'm just telling you that I was going through some stuff and I just wanted to escape. And I would I would enter into and I would enter into that little world right there and for over five hours in the night. But yeah, I, I definitely watch five episodes of a show in one night. At night, just I'm not, I'm just not here for five hours. You see, and and it's just like and it's a form of escapism. And so that's on the lower end. I mean, it's not really that low because I mean you can get into some stuff that is definitely not good for you, amen. But but there's so many other things, and so you get the point. So that that has partly to do with this illustration. So if this is the moon. And, and so that's the moon, right? And this is the sun. We, we know these things. This is the sun, right? And then we would say this is the earth. And then this is the moon, okay? And so just as the, the moon reflects the glory of the sun, you and I are supposed to be a reflection of the glory of the sun. You and I are supposed to be a reflection of the glory of Jesus. The light of God is supposed to emanate from our lives yes. if we're believers. Amen? I'm trying to tell you the truth. All right? But could we also say right here, could we say the earth as physical, but could we call it the world? And we'll use it as a spiritual connotation. Right? So it's not, it's not just the earth in the physical sense. It's the world in a spiritual sense. And what I'm trying to say is this, is that the world is getting in the way of the sun yes. and it's impeding the light that's supposed to be reflecting off of us. And so now with this, I find like the Lord put this on my heart because there's different phases of the moon, correct? And so now whenever there's more world that's getting in the way of the light of the sun. Let's just go ahead and put an O right here. I feel better about that. Whenever, whenever there's more world that's getting in the way of the sun, then it's blocking the light. And now there's just a little sliver of reflection that's coming off of the literal moon. And the more of the world you have impeding you, the more idols, the more things you have in your life that stand in front of, of the Lord in your life, the more the less reflection of God's glory that's coming off of your life and then now if the purpose of the church was to be a light to the world salt to the earth and if the whole church not the whole church if the if much of the church has allowed the world within its doors and has become more worldly than spiritual then now what does the reflection look like upon the earth it results in Darkness, because look, whenever it's nighttime and the moon is full, you can see better outside. Whenever there's just a sliver of reflection in the moon at nighttime, it's more difficult to see if you're in not a, a well-lit area. So what I'm trying to tell you is, is that this is part of the problem, I believe. This is the problem of the world that we're living in. That, that man born of Adam is born into sin, and that even the church is supposed to be re reflecting the glory of God, but because we don't understand how to really live for the Lord, because we don't understand that his sacrifice is all sufficient, and then even when we do, many times, and listen, we've all been guilty of it, even when we do know these things, we're not necessarily really living it that way. And we're allowing things to come into our life that are obscuring the light of God. And, and I got to tell you that it, it's a problem. You know, it's a problem for us and it's a problem for God. God wants us. I mean, I don't know that God really has any problems. Maybe that's the right way to say it. But, 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 but he wants us working with him, right? 
So let's take a look at uh, Colossians chapter 1, verses 12 through 15. It says, uh, giving thanks unto the Father. So this is Colossians chapter 1, verses 12 through 15. Giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet. That's the King James Version. I looked up the NIV, the NASB, the ESV, and they all use the word qualified. Okay, giving thanks unto the Father which has made us qualified to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. I asked the prisoners this and they got it right. So I'll ask you, how were you translated from the kingdom of darkness? into the kingdom of his dear son. Well, the same old boy, I'll just give you the answer, said, born again, hallelujah. And because at conversion, right, you were born of Adam, you were born into darkness, but when you got saved, the miracle happened and you were translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son, amen? As a matter of fact, Romans 6 would teach this. I used to do this all the time. I grabbed this thing here. And the word of God says in Romans 6 that you were baptized into Christ. And that's not talking about water baptism. It's talking about the Holy Spirit putting you in Jesus. So, and I, and I say this a lot, and I've said it a lot lately. So just bear with me. I, I'm not losing my mind. I'm just talking to a lot of people. Uh, so what ends up happening is, is this is how I see it. Jesus died on the cross 2,000 years ago. It requires faith of a human being for that sacrifice to be, I'm going to use a fancy word and I'll explain, efficacious. Efficacy means effective. It requires faith from the human being for that sacrifice to be his and for that to be effective in his life. So Jesus died 2,000 years ago, but here you and I are living in 2023, and maybe a family member recently got saved, maybe somebody you know recently got converted. It was at that moment in time when they put their faith in Christ that it's almost like the Lord would have hit a rewind button, brought us back 2,000 years ago, and in God's mind, you were in Adam, right? I'm getting a little bit seasoned. So you were in Adam, and, you, and in God's mind, you died with him. And the Bible says you were baptized into Christ. You were baptized into his burial. And even as he was raised from the dead, you too should walk in newness of life. And so in God's mind, I need you to know that you, you literally, in God's mind, died with Jesus, the old man that you were. And in God's mind, you really were buried with Jesus. I used to like my favorite preacher, Lauren Larson, used to say, you know, whenever Fifi dies, that's the dog. <laughs> when, whenever the pet dog dies and you got to go bury Fifi, you don't go dig Fifi back up and play with her. And so when the old man dies, we're supposed to allow him to stay dead. Right. Amen. Lord, help us to let the old man stay dead. Praise God. And so he, he goes on to say that we were translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. This is the part I want you to see. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. I wanted you to see that. It's saying that Jesus, who's the image of the invisible? Jesus. Jesus. It, it, did he say that Matt was the image of the invisible God? He didn't say that, but he did. But the word of God does say that Jesus is in Matt and that Matt is in Jesus. And hallelujah, now we have become one. Amen. But I just want to make the point. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. And so this right here is telling us that God's plan, even though man fell in Adam, even though Adam was created in the image and likeness of God, and even though Adam fell and man now is born in the image and likeness of Adam, God has a plan to, re to produce his image and likeness in man through his relationship with Jesus is what I'm trying to let you see right here. So number one, he's made us qualified through the redemption of his blood, which translated us from darkness to light. He has removed us from darkness and into his light. He is the image of God. And now in the light, we can reflect his glory. Let me say that one more time. He pulled us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. And now that we're in the light, we can reflect his glory. Amen. Amen. 
We're supposed to reflect his glory. Praise God. All right. So let's take a look at Colossians chapter 3. We're in the same chapter, verses 5 uh, through 10. It says, now we, we mentioned the first part of this verse Sunday, but I didn't go read the whole thing. Okay, so we're going to read verses 5 through 10. And you'll remember the, the first word for sure, mortify. Remember that? We talked about what, is a, what does that mean to mortify? What, did we talk about this Sunday or Sunday night? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. What does it mean? It's the work of the mortician, right? To put something, to, to, to deal with dead things. So he says, put to death your members which are upon the earth. He's talking about your body parts. And look what he, he lists them. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence. That word concupiscence just means all kinds of lust, right? Covetousness, which is idolatry. All these things are idolatry. So look, he said it. You didn't need me to get up there with the chair. Okay, the word of God says it right here. All these things are idolatry. They're all getting in the way of, of Jesus. They're all standing in the way, these lifestyles, okay? And so he says, in which you also walked sometime when you lived in them. So he's saying, you used to walk in this when you lived that way. But you don't walk that way anymore. You don't live that way anymore. Back whenever in the 80s when I was a young teenage boy, they had a, 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 a group called the, I don't know if they were the Go-Go's or the Bangles or something. But they came out with a song that was called Walk Like an Egyptian. And, and But the scripture is going to try to tell us, no, you don't walk like an Egyptian. You walk like a Hebrew. Amen. You walk like those that belong to to God. Amen. And so, uh, so don't walk like an Egyptian is the point I want you to know. So he goes on to say this. He says, uh, now, but now you also have put off all these things, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another. You know, I was looking earlier, Proverbs chapter six says there's six, there's six things the Lord hates. Yea, seven is an abomination. One of the, the second one is a lying tongue. The Lord hates a lying tongue, man. Okay, and, and seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. And so there we have the connection of the image is connected to the knowledge and the word knowledge there is connected to the word that we talked about Sunday, epignosis, and it has an experiential aspect of it. Whenever we're living our lives in such a way that we're not reflecting the image of the Lord, listen, if you truly belong to God, he's going to work with you, my friend. He's going to work with you. He's going to deal with you. And he's going to convict you. Amen. And he's going to love you. Praise God. Man, look, me and Sean were having a talk last night after prayer. And it was a good talk. And I mean, we were both agreeing. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your grace. Amen. That you didn't, that you didn't come back when I wasn't ready. You know what I'm talking about? Yes, Lord. Amen. Right. Right. Amen. So renewed in knowledge after the image of him who renewed and he renews our mind. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Um, so this this scripture here uh, in first, second Corinthians chapter three, verse 18, the word. 2 Corinthians 3, 18. The word image is not right here. Uh, it says, but we all with open face beholding in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. I'm not going to be able to finish everything because I realize it's already after 8 o'clock. But I want you to know that what he's talking about here was that the glory of the Old Testament and that Moses put a veil over his face to hide that the glory was fading. Um, but what he's, what he's saying is, is this, that in the new covenant, we, it's like we can behold in a looking glass or, or a mirror and we can see the glory of the Lord in our lives is what he's saying. And, and, and we're being changed into the same image of, as the Lord from glory to glory, 
even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So now that we know that Jesus is the image, the, uh, the, the image of the invisible God, and we know that the Holy Spirit is producing, fat forming and fashioning Jesus on the inside of us, that through the process of sanctification, amen, we start to take upon the nature of Jesus, amen, and the fruit of the Spirit begins to be produced in our life. And so we don't continue to act the same way that we used to act it because it's a work of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So we're not we're not going around being mean anymore. We're not being bitter. We're not, you know, cussing and fussing. We're not praise God. We're not, you know, whatever you whatever you used to do. Okay. Whatever I used to do. We're being changed. All right. Now, so he, he changed into his image from glory to glory by the spirit of God. Now, I want you to see this one real quick. Second Corinthians 4, 4. So this, this is part of the problem. He's got a plan. The enemy has a plan, right? And, and, and this is what the Word of God says, 2 Corinthians 4, 4. In whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, look at this, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. See, the enemy is working with everything that he has in his arsenal to try to bring deception and to blind the eyes of people. And he uses false doctrine. He uses false religion to try to blind people from the truth of Jesus that can truly change them and transform them into the image of Jesus. And so again, it goes back to lies. It goes back to the chains of bondage that have to be broken because of the lies that are being told through false religion and also through false doctrine. Because the truth of the word will actually begin to allow the light of God to shine upon us and begin to produce the image of God in us. So number four, I, I said the enemy has a plan to blind the eyes of people from the gospel of Christ. For it is through the gospel of Christ that the image of God is revealed to man's heart. And it is the Spirit's work through the gospel that changes us from glory to glory and moment by moment into the image of God where we can begin to outwardly reflect what he has placed in us inwardly. That's so important that the people of God are a reflection of the Lord's glory. Amen. Amen. Praise God. This I love this scripture. You don't have to turn there. I only got two left. And singers, musicians, y'all can come up. And, and, you know, we always like to sing. Amen. Sing a song. Give glory to the Lord. Praise God. You never know. You might need prayer. Uh, but look, 2 Corinthians 4, 7 says this. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. I just, I love that scripture. I think that there was a, there's a music group called, uh, I think that's where they got their name from, Jars of Clay, right? Jars of Clay got their name from that. And, and because an earthen vessel is made from the, from the clay of the earth. Mm -hmm. And what it's saying is that, is that God has placed his glory on the inside of jars of clay, on the inside of earthen vessels. And it's such a, it's such a beautiful thing. He says, he says, we have this treasure the kingdom of God. J Jesus said the kingdom of God is in you. The kingdom of God is in your is in earthen vessels. And the beauty of that is this, is that if we will really let God change us from who we used to be, I'm telling you right now, it's going to bring glory to God on earth because people are going to know it was a work of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Right. And that it wasn't us that fixed ourselves. Praise God. Now, I'm just going to close with Revelation 13, 15, because we talked about 59 times in the Old Testament about how the image was talking about molten images, graven images, and idolatry. See, because the enemy has a plan. And he wants images to be erected so that people will worship him right. instead of worshiping God. Revelation 13, 15 says this. He had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast, that they should be killed. That's ultimately the enemy's plan is to steal the glory of God and to, re and to reverse God, to change God's image, right? 
inside of man and that instead he wants to try to place his image inside of man and he wants to steal God's worship. But I got good news for you, amen. If you're born again tonight, the image of God is on the inside of you, and we just gotta we just gotta release it, amen, and let it let it shine. Hallelujah. Let's worship the Lord. Thank you.